I want to uh, present my fun approach to fun graph today. It's called um, Space Party Dualism Theory. Um, it's connected to uh, an interpretation of quantum mechanics called the Similar Worlds Theory. Um, um, this is a bit strange here. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we know that when we want to measure a particle, um, it's, it's impossible to measure it with infinite accuracy and we always think, uh, the first impression is that this is a constraint to, only a constraint to how, how much we can know about nature while nature actually has some definite properties, but that's not the case. In fact, um, our limits of knowledge are uh, at the same time the limits of nature and that, that suggests that uh, we are nature, and that um, essentially everything exists within consciousness. And we can also see that in the behavior of particles, we, we, we cannot know the position of a particle with infinite precision, and, that, and, and how much we know about the particle in, influences the behavior of the particle. So basically the world we live in is exactly the world uh, Bishop Berkeley uh, had envisioned that things exist only when they are seen. So to be is to be perceived. Um, Can you guys just sit with there, just like okay. a, by your hand, just go up and down. Yeah, that's, that's good. Now, now you'd be okay. Okay. Yeah, that's so good. this is um, so there are other interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, what what is actually a measurement? Um, uh, the world is made of information. Information requires somebody to know it. Measuring is about knowing, so measurement requires consciousness. What about other interpretations? Uh, there's many worlds, many minds, the coherence. But um, only in the traditional, the orthodox interpretation, you have <coughs> consciousness actually doing something, choosing between different alternatives. Because if everything happens at the same time as in many worlds theory, there's nothing to choose and nothing ever happens, there's also no time. Tip, most typical thing about many worlds interpretation is that you, 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 you get lost and time just slips away. So, but that cannot be true because we know from Gödel that um, consciousness is not, um, is not deterministic, um, it's, it's not computable. So it might be deterministic, but it's not computable. The outcome of a logical argument is predetermined by logic, but it's it's not um, computable because you cannot use a computer to derive a logical argument if you didn't input it in the first way. So what about quantum strangeness? There's quantum non locality, entanglement, superpositions. All these needs to be explained. These are, are mysteries and mostly they are ignored. Um, how can a particle manage to be at many places at the same time? Uh, first we need to look at phase space. One point in phase space represents the universe at one moment in time. There are six dimensions for every particle, three for uh, position and three for impulse. Now you could imagine the passage of time as, uh, as a collective point, let's say a collective point of consciousness moving through this phase space. Similar states are close to each other, so you could imagine the beginning of time being here and it may be moving all through here. <clears throat> But then we have quantum theory, and in quantum theory, the, in quantum mechanics, um, the, no particle has a precise position and an impulse. So you could represent quantum mechanics by extending this point in phase space by a cloud in phase space. You could call it the conscious cloud. So this is a similar world theory. So, um, if you if you want to talk about uh, 
space time, you, you, you could talk about equivalent uh, or similar spaces or space times, those which cannot be distinguished. And the number, the number, of, the logarithm of the number of those spaces is entropy. Exists in all worlds, we cannot distinguish. This is similar worlds theory. So, in, on each space, spins are orthogonal. So there's no mystery here. There's no spooky action at a distance. Every time you measure, you pick out one of the wor worlds, and 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 you find the spins to be orthogonal. Then you have also a problem here: relativity and uncertainty in uh, relativity theory. <clears throat> we we different observers for different observers different things are simultaneous. We seem to be forced to view present, past, and future as all equally real. Because for me, maybe all, this is real, this is the present, but for somebody else, this might be the present. We have this problem here, that, that we might be forced to, to view the whole of space time to be existing all simultaneously. Does this apply only to high speeds? No, it does not. There could be an alien just slowly walking on the other side of the universe. If he walks walks toward me, my future will be on his slide of uh, of his slice of simultaneity of his, and on his now slice. He walks away from me. My past will be on his now slice. Mm -hmm. But um, so we seem to be forced to this conclusion. But um, but there, there's a conflict. The wave function collapses everywhere simultaneously all over space. So the question is, is the future already out there? So let's take a look. Um, can our hypothetical alien um, see our future? No, he cannot. He can only see what's on his past like cone. He could never collapse the wave function of my future. Can I, can I just ask a question before I forget? On what justification the wave function collapses? Why did I because our knowledge about nature changes the way function who, represents who the, some else. Who make the, uh, the, uh, our consciousness. Can you, you make the, the, uh, the, uh, the way Yeah, we collect you, you make it collapse. Yeah, right. Suppose you have two or three people observing how many times this uh, wave function has to collapse. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's five people. Uh, the consciousness of all yeah. people is how connected. Many times those the consciousness of all people is connected, so it doesn't matter if I see it or you see it, it's the same, according to this model. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> so, so, according to this view, the past is not there anymore and the future is not, not there yet. Okay, the, the, the past might be there as, as some non-local information, like in parapsychology, but that's another topic. Um, so there's just only the past life cone. That's all what we have from space time. So, so basically, according to this model, there there is no space time. There's only this past life cone, this uh, immediate reality and the past life cone. So the passage of time looks you doesn't look like a. You go back another slide. Go back to that slide. You have many spaces. So waste the time. Uh, no, there's there's no time here. We come to the time in the next slide. So this is just the sim similar spaces. spaces. Similar spaces. Uh, we cannot distinguish this. Um, so time is now, so all those different um, slices, the similar space, you put them together. So this is the equivalence group of uh, at one time. So we jump from one equivalence group to the next group. Every time the wave function collapses, the assembly of S similar uh, spaces is different, and it's really just spaces, not re not space okay. times. Um, so the conclusion is we are not spaghetti or columns in a thing called space time. There is no world line in, in relative theory. You have this world line, mm -hmm. and, and two people meet, so, so there are some columns or spaghetti or whatever. <laughs> so Minkowski was wrong, and Einstein was criticizing Minkowski um, first, but then accepted. His uh, space time paradigm. Now we come to what I call, it's really just me who calls it that, but weakness, weakness conflict. 
And so video of Wigner where he denied his uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, he changed his opinion uh, for some reasons. Um, if only things on the light cone surface are real, then what about people around me? Are they unreal? I, I have a past light cone, so Wigner was worrying about this. If you're on my past light cone and I, I collapse on the wave function of, of, of your past, if you collapse the wave function of my past, then, then is everybody here just an illusion and just me exists? And many people actually, when you read books about uh, quantum philosophy, and you see that, that the um, Copenhagen interpretation or the orthodox interpretation is criticized for uh, that it may lead to solipsism, like that only you exist, everybody else is just the illusion. So that's a, that's a big problem and Wigner could not solve it at all. He couldn't figure out how to do quantum mechanics in, in space time because there's this light speed limitation. So um, how do we solve this? Um, with entanglement, because everything that uh, interacts is entangled. So everything, basically everything on Earth is entangled. So, uh, but then you could say, oh yeah, maybe, but maybe that was a big bang and the everything, everything has interacted maybe before. But what do you do with an infinite universe? Did everything interact? So according to my theory. It only counts if it happened after the emergence of life. Only that counts. So you don't have any entanglement with the remote universe. So that's that's all the different individual light cones of different people and also animals, including dogs and cats. And uh, I don't know how much further down you can go, like insects. We don't know. You shouldn't need to do experiments. I proposed actually an experiment to test that. So um, all these together form a collective light cone. Um, <clears throat> but this model of saying that all the worlds we cannot distinguish exist simultaneously, and that's why we have superpositions, why particles can be here and there at the same time, it explains um, how there can be entanglement, but it doesn't explain why probabilities are like waves. Like if you want to explain all of physics from from prime principles, you would need to explain everything, like also why probabilities are wave-like. Um, so that's the second part of my theory. Uh, the wave nature can be understood as a movement in another complex dimension of space, which makes the particle undetectable on some of its superpositions part of movement. So <clears throat> um, every so we come to that in a moment. <clears throat> So, so, so you have you have every particle has an elementary space, and the particle moves around this elementary space. So it leaves the real part and goes into the imaginary part, and then comes back. So when you look at the equivalence group, you basically have the probability for the particle to be measured on one path of movement going up and down like this. But it's all in superposition. So on some other part path, the probability for it to be measured might be higher. So it's basically it creates a wave. Or built away. So this leads over from space, uh, from similar worlds theory to space particle dualism, which were united in 2006. Originally, I just thought about quantizing space, and I, and it was just a coincidence. And then I discovered by coincidence that actually this is needed for this. I had noted before that actually, hmm, but why is it wave-like? And and then I created this uh, a bit later, and then I found the connection. Okay, let's talk about space first a little bit. According to Einstein, space can bend and twist. If so, it must be something, it cannot be nothing. Why Einstein able to curve space? I don't agree actually with uh, <coughs> he the model treated, curves. He treated time as an independent variable. Mm. If time is, is based according to yeah, actually, Einstein also uh, experiment with other models. Yeah. Could you, so, could you, don't you think Einstein may make a mistake? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about here right now. Uh, say it again, from, just from, uh, yeah. from the beginning. He, he did just say one more time, this segment. Um, if 
According to Einstein, space can bend and twist, so it must be something, it can't be nothing. What is it made of? What is it made of? So this is this uh, funny, the black hole particle analogy. So many people have thought about this, it's not, a, it's not too, too much of an idea. Uh, if particles are point-like, then there must be like tiny black holes. Nadia Sheldon once described to Hawking in an episode of Big Bang Theory. Um, so, advantage, gravity shields itself away. When you want to, in particle physics there's this problem that if particles are point-like, then you have basically an electric charge that's compressed infinitely down and the more you compress it, the more energy you need and you would end up with infinite energy. But that doesn't happen because once you have an event horizon, that increase doesn't go on. Um, but you can't have those black holes evaporate away because then you, you, your particles are lost. Right? So precondition is radiation stuff for black holes more than the Planck length, which makes sense because for, for those, the energy of the radiation would be bigger than the whole mass energy of the black hole. Uh, yet such small black holes can't eat anything. So question, can we use the event horizons as filling block, blocks of space itself? Um, indeed, the surface of a black hole is the most direct way to link mass or energy to a surface. One could try to construct a three-dimensional space out of two-dimensional surfaces. So this is a seemingly straight path of a particle in flat space. So you zoom in, zoom in, and then you find it's actually not going straight. You can call this a Grandmore space. Um, so are there enough of these elementary spaces to form a gapless pattern of space? You need to So the patchwork, so this is quantized space. Patchwork consists mainly of virtual particles, vacuum fluctuations. But very important, they are not like black holes, it's not black holes. It's elementary space must be bigger, G must be replaced by another constant called GE. <clears throat> GE is the elementary space constant and is about 10 to the power of 36 times larger than G. So 10 to the power of 36 is basically the difference between electromagnetism and gravity. That's how much uh, stronger is electromagnetism. Uh, replacing G by GE of course puts an end to the black hole particle analogy and we cannot now talk about elementary space and event horizon independently. So they're two different things. <clears throat> so, um, and they behave, behave differently. Actually, elementary spaces are much more similar to black holes we talk about in the mainstream because a black hole depends on the energy, the mass energy inside the black hole. That's, the, that's what the size of a black hole depends on. And um, that's what the size of an elementary space depends on too. So, um, so that, that's here the, the energy here. But according to the space particleism theory, a black hole doesn't depend on the energy, it depends on the uh, number of quarks, as we will see later. The theory can be visualized by this artwork I made in 2005. Um, this is German Elementarräume, elementary spaces, and you have this magnifying glass here. Uh, the, this, this background looks two-dimensional, but when you look at and, and this path looks straight, but when you look at it through the magnifying glass, you see that it's actually zigzagging through these small elementary spaces. And on some places it's more dense, and some places less dense. So if you had a particle um, passing by here, it would be attracted to this uh, darker area here. <coughs> and, and that's gravity, basically. Granular or broken dimensionality. So you could also transform this picture of this overlapping elementary space into this type of diagram, which looks more a bit more like mainstream quantized space, like in other theories. So <coughs> um, for a two-dimensional model, where you have one-dimensional elementary space, it's like one spheres. Uh, you could use this equation to describe the dimensionality. So 
if you have a lot of these uh, circles, you will get close to 1.9 and 1.99, uh, you get close to 2, so you can get 1.9, 1.99, 1.99 and so on. But the conclusion why you put in this type D for one plus one plus, is it to put it to the power? So it's, 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 to, it's, to dis it's actually an alternative to describe curvature, like Einstein used um, this curvature tensor and I use broken dimensionality. So, um, for two dimensions, 10 connections, like n represents the number of connections, 10 connections lead to 1.9. For three dimensions, you need this square root, because when you have three dimensions to access, like for two dimensions, like 10 directions already give you a very good feeling of two dimensionality here. But for three dimensions, you will need a lot of more. So that's why that is square root, which I added later. I didn't add it in 2005. <coughs> so gravity is differences in the density of elementary spaces. Um, so the hierarchy problem, gravity is 10 to the power of 38 times weaker than the strong force, 10 to the power of 36 times weaker than the electromagnetic force, 10 to the power of uh, 29 times weaker than the weak force. Why is gravity so incredibly weak? Um, according to a space particleism theory, because gravity is just a side effect of the other forces. Um, the, the size of the elementary space isn't proportional to the strength gravity, but the strength of the other forces. This means that G, that determines the size of the elementary space, needs to be scaled up to their strength. It seems as if we would have to go for the difference between gravity and the united GUT force which would be somewhere like 10 to the power of 37. Um, but in fact, the differences, the difference between that and the electromagnetism is only due to the running of coupling. Therefore, using the difference between gravity and electromagnetism is fine. Uh, running of coupling means that the strength of the forces changes with energy and at very high energies they unite. But basically, uh, using if, if, if you were to use the strength of the GAUT force, then you would have to use the naked mass and naked charge, and, and, and that just cancels just out each other out. <clears throat> By calculating the vector managed density, we can know the granular dimensionality of empty space, and it's this. So if every difference in, in, in granular dimensionality can only appear here, like uh, 36. Uh, digits after the comma, then that explains why it is so weak. Because if, if there are already so many elementary spaces there, and there's already so many connections, you put an elect electron here, and you have this virtual photons coming out, you have a higher density, but it's already, it's already up to this. So it doesn't make a big difference. You need a whole planet to uh, a moon or, uh, or, or an Earth to, to feel gravity. So, what does this mean for cosmology? Flatness problem in Einstein's theory, the chance of having a flat universe is only 1 to 10 to the power of 62, incredibly tiny. Yet we live in a universe that is totally flat as far as we can see. So there was a uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey trying to find the curvature, and the result was that if the our universe is actually a closed universe, which most cosmologists prefer because it's easy to do energy conversation, it collapses back and then you have the energy back and, and so forth. Um, and for it to be closed, the visible universe would have to be only 0.25% of the whole universe. And that makes it, and, and the further we look out and the further we find that it's flat, the more unlikely it becomes. It's, it's like balancing a, and a needle on its top for thousands of years. Because you need, in in, in nine sense cosmology, you need, or in, free, in the Friedman models, you need to have the right expansion speed and the right gravity, and they need to cancel each other out, they need to balance each other out in order to have the universe uh, expand to the size. If it expands too fast, then you cannot have stars. If it expands too slow, it will just collapse back. That's an essence theory, it doesn't happen in my theory. Uh, solution, the geometry of space partisan theory allows only flat universes because if you have this patchwork of elementary space and the spheres which overlap and form three-dimensional space, there is no real curvature. 
is still geometrical because um, things fall down when you throw something down it falls down because near the, of the bottom uh, there are more elementary space more connections so it always follows the path with the more with where there are more connections so the universe can only be flat and 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 that also that's also what Newton said because Newton said that why why is the universe not collapsing because if endless many stars are pulling from here and from here and from all directions yeah. and if there's no center there can be no collapse but I, I uh, but Friedman somehow just took Einstein's field equation and, and and they actually just apply for one to one black hole or one earth or one moon and two black holes you already cannot get an exact solution so what do people do they just take Einstein's field equations uh, the equation for a black hole take it upside down and then say, okay, black hole is a collapsing star, so if we take it upside down, it looks like an expanding universe, so we just take that equation and it's fine. But, and then people say, oh, Einstein predicted the expansion of the universe, but then if he predicted it, why did he predict it after Hubble observed it? So if it's a prediction, he should say it more early. <laughs> yeah. and, and not only that, he should also say how fast it's expanding, in cosmology, we're so used to just look out. Oh, what's the da what's the data? Okay, this is the data. Okay, this is our equation. So, but in in, in cosmology, to this day, no single prediction, correct prediction, was ever made in mainstream cosmology. Um, okay, so this also solves the vacuum catastrophe problem. Even just a cubic meter of empty space contains more vacuum energy than there's energy in form of ordinary matter in the visible universe. So that's a huge amount of energy. According to Einstein's general relativity, this energy should have destroyed the universe within fractions of a second. Well, this has a negative pressure and would, should destroy the universe, but it doesn't. So that's a huge problem. Before uh, the accelerated expansion of the universe was discovered, people thought, uh, oh, there must, uh, there must be supersymmetry, and in supersymmetry, in, in the vacuum, um, the particles and the supersymmetric partners, they have their energy cancels out as positive and negative. So, no, so, it's, um, so they always thought vacuum energy is zero, and that's why we don't have this catastrophe. And then they f f found that the universe is expanding faster and faster. So, so they th thought, oh, maybe there's a tiny little bit of vacuum energy and that causes the universe to expand accelerately. But it just doesn't work, it would have to be so tiny, it would be an incredible function. And there's nothing, there's no theory in which you can come up with a tiny little bit of vacuum energy. And the second problem is that if it's something in space, it's, uh, and, and space is expanding, there's more and more of this vacuum energy, and it would have to go to the curve, the expansion curve should be to the uh, power of three would be like x power of 3 curve, but if you look at it, it's an x to the power of 2 curve, mm. which contradicts totally vacuum energy. Of course, they can put in gravity and, and adjust it. Okay, I'll put a bit more gravity in, so you can have, have it match. Yeah, but it's all fine tuned. Solution in space parallelism theory, uh, a high level of vacuum energy only weakens the gravity between material objects. Only differences in granular dimensionality cause gravity, not some absolute energy value. So the more that vacuum energy you have, the more connections you already have in empty space, and the weaker is gravity because there are all this two point nine 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 million nines. So there's no vacuum catastrophe here. Um, if gravity doesn't influence the expansion of the universe, if the universe can't collapse, because gravity from different directions cancels out. And if there was no inflation, I mean inflation is just a trick to explain away the flatness problem, then what made it expand in the first place? So here's entropic expansion. The universe expands in order to compensate the entropy increase in, in it. Uh, most entropies in black holes, it actually dwarfs all the entropy anywhere else. Uh, black hole entropy grows exponentially because it is proportional to the square of the black hole's mass. So you feed, let's say you feed a black hole one marshmallow at a time, 
the mask goes up like this, a straight line linear, but the entropy will go up like this because it's proportion to the surface and the surface is the square. Therefore the universe grows exponentially and very shockingly the entropy density of the universe is a constant. Yeah. And actually I think Penrose almost got to there but not quite. He, he drew a diagram where he uh, wrote down the entropy of the universe how it goes up and, and, and it, was, it was like kind of in the same uh, mm, cost grains of, of his space space, but, but at the Big Bang he had it going up. You know, in the logic, you say that entropy in the universe is constant? Hmm? It's entropy. Entropy, and entropy, is entropy oh, density, density, only the density, not the entropy. Not, because in cosmology you can only talk about a density, because there is no quarter. Uh, so are you define entropy density? Entropy per uh, unit of space, volume of space. Why is that entropy in unit space will be constant? <clears throat> uh, so you have you, you have a cosmic box, and you have many black holes in it. So it has a certain entropy, and the black holes are growing. So the entropy in the box should be growing, but it's not because the but space it, is expanding. It, so many black holes leave that. Transparent box. The box expanding. Yes, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about because we want to know the entropy density of the densities per unit of space. So we, if we look at a big cosmic unit of space, and we have many black holes there, it's let's say it's a transparent box that doesn't change in size. So you want to know how much how much entropy there is in it. So the black holes, they grow and there should be more and more and more entropy, but it's not because space is expanding, so the black holes, they leave the, the, your box, they go out of the box. So at the end, maybe just one single black, big black hole is left in the box. Um, <clears throat> although black holes are growing, the entropy in our cosmic box always remains the same because the expansion makes many black holes leave the box. When we look at the universe backwards in time, it can only shrink when black holes shrink. This is very important. That means uh, the model is only consistent when assuming the existence of primordial black holes. And many people assume primordial black holes because you cannot explain the evolution of galaxies well without them. You need the seeds. You have a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. <coughs> Primordial black holes naturally form from cold dark matter, and uh, cold dark matter is not not a big assumption. Everybody most, or most people assume that dark matter is cold, and it's just a question how cold. I think it's almost absolutely cold. Because if it, it was hot, like if it was neutrinos, neutrinos cannot collide; they just go through everything. So they could not go, come together because of gravity. We cannot use neutrinos for dark matter. Um, primordial black holes, you have this box here. Intermediate black holes and then supermassive black holes. So at the end, you are left with one black hole in your box. Entropy density estimates based on the intergalactic distance produced by space particles. Um, okay, this is a bit complicated. This, I will come to this later. Um, when you <clears throat> when you squeeze down the universe, when you look at the universe backwards in time, you have those black holes shrinking, and you look at when when they basically shrink till they disappear, and then you can find out what was the initial temperature of the universe. And through many calculations, you come up with a number of six thousand Kelvin. <clears throat> Where does primordial dark matter come from. Um, for figuring it out, we have to look at the structure of elementary spaces. Uh, originally, the theory was distinguishing between the elementary space itself and the source mass energy. So, um, those elementary spaces, they are complex. And originally, it was thought of like an event horizon or something. So, I was using a complex mass to get that, and then I was distinguishing between between the source mass and 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 
the resulting mass, and, and that led to some rich structure, which I thought, oh, this is this is nice. You have a complex number, and this uh, this creates so much so much structure. You could just maybe identify different particles with this. And but after ten years, it turned out that it's 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 way too this model is um, way too asymmetric. You have um, uh, then you have a universe split up into a real uh, positive, negative, imaginary part of the universe, negative, imaginary part of the universe. Um, so we can interpret the those who have a minus here as dark because they have no real part. If they have no real part, they must be dark. Um, so you could, if you flip the signs, you can have an antiparticle and so on. Um, okay, significant particle physics properties. Um, so you could look at uh, the simple photon. Its, it's spin is very constrained. It can only go go like this. It can only be orthogonal to the direction of movement. So you could represent with a with only one complex dimension. And um, and the uh, fermions with two um, and different generations of particles you could explain with um, um, with having more than one particle in one elementary space. <clears throat> and I, I published a paper on the on the masses of particles that they actually come from the energy of in in the force field. So anyway, there are several problems with the above model. Distinguishing between source energy and surface uh, seems to violate strict, strict geometrism. So, um, because everything should be based on geometry, it would be much nicer if you have just the surface, and bigger surface means more energy, small surface means smaller energy. And if you distinguish between the two, it's such a straightforward. Uh, it's too asymmetric. Um, the treatment of what is an antiparticle. I don't go into the details of that, but it's, it's too asymmetrical. Um, <clears throat> so, um, actually, the way you can uh, get elementary particles is through symmetries. Um, in quantum gravity, also in string theory and other theories, usually it's assumed that the symmetries in particle physics are reflected in the structure of space. So string theory has so many dimensions, so that's why they have huge particle suit that needs to be discovered, um, all these supersymmetric particles. Uh, E8 theory, all these theories, they have a lot of um, undiscovered particles. Um, but my theory is based on two-dimensional complex spheres. So that's actually the symmetries of particle physics, SU2 stands for the symmetries of a two-sphere, complex two-sphere, and so on. Um, <clears throat> the, the model we saw just now, the old model, was too complicated. Now this model is very simple. Uh, it's super simple. Uh, what is an antiparticle? An antiparticle is a particle where you flip the sign of the, uh, the imaginary part. Um, plus becomes minus. So antiparticle the imaginary part becomes negative. So dark matter, the real part becomes negative. That's dark matter. And then you can also think about, um, uh, did I write it here or not? Uh, you could also think of a elementary space which is only real or imaginary, but they would have no wave functions, so I called them classitrons, like classical, <laughs> but they would also be dark and very hypothetical at first. Um, uh, so this also solves the, the low entropy uh, mystery. People since many hundreds of years think that the universe must have started with, with a very low entropy because that's the only way thing, time can exist. That's what people think. But that's not the case here. If you have a lot of primordial black holes, then there's no line. Actually, 
Roger Penrose admitted that he, he cannot prove that there wasn't actually a problem with glycosis and MPP was higher. He just assumes that it was very, very low. But if you ask him, he cannot prove that it was really that low. <coughs> so it was full of promoted black holes. Um, so anthropic expansion allows the universe to follow the local laws of thermodynamics we observe. Um, horizon problem. <coughs> Why is the universe homogeneous and isotropic as far as we can see? Let's look at it. <clears throat> Temperature differences between different regions are all below 200 microkelvin. So the more or less homogeneous nature of the na universe can be explained by a tropic expansion because if you would want to, like let's say you want to make it uh, asymmetric, very asymmetric, and you push all the black holes together, they have all this huge entropy, it will lead to entropic expansion and you cannot do it basically. Impossible to, but there is some interesting asymmetries here to be found. I don't know how many of you have heard of <coughs> the C and B anomalies. Um, we will come to now. Um, temperature of this is um, small, but it does it really look homogeneous? Um, many people have looked at it and, and said it doesn't look homogeneous at all. Although the smallness of the temperature difference may give us the impression of a hum homogeneous universe, the way hotter and colder spots are arranged of the sky does not. Relations in the sky that exceed two degrees are unexplainable in the standard model, yet we have relations in the CMB that ex extend over 60 degrees. It's, um, many, some, many people have pointed out that, that this is unexplainable in, in both the uh, uh, Big Bang Theory and um, Inflation Theory. So Max Tegmark did a very nice analysis. You can uh, hear about it also in, in the movie The Principle, <clears throat> a very controversial movie about um, how we exist in a very special place in the universe. Uh, and there was this axis of evil uh, among which hot, hot and cold spots in the micro background are arranged on. <clears throat> so it's, it's basically a, a north-south asymmetry. So the, and then we have the alignment of the CMB with uh, planets correlated to Earth's rotation axis and its orbit around the Sun. So the ecliptic and the equinox. Um, <clears throat> the equinox plane corresponds to the dipole structure and the ecliptic plane corresponds to the quadrupole structure. But, so these are spherical harmonics. <coughs> Max Tegmark has discovered this, and he ho he hoped it to go away with the 2014 Planck satellite data. Um, he was brushing his teeth in the morning and, and look and, and looking at the TV for the picture to be released, and looked at the original picture and was the same. So he said the the Copernic the the outview of humanity on the Copernican principle uh, it, it went. It went uh, away from the geocentric view and then swung, swung back again. <laughs> so, but that was super controversial for him to say, and basically he, he dropped out of cosmology after that. And he's doing AI now. Um, we can explain this by the not So this is a very this is very crazy. So this is a very crazy part of my theory. <laughs> so we can explain this by the not asymmetry of Earth. So. Uh, Um, we can explain the various cold spots with fewer conscious observers at the poles. The odds against chance for this anomaly is 1 in 3500. So, yeah, this is a, <laughs> this sounds very crazy, but um, if you believe that the universe really emerged, that there's only us and nobody else, and, and even, let's say I'm wrong, and, and and um, and my interpretation of quantum mechanics is wrong. And actually, the whole universe can exist without being observed, like maybe rocks <coughs> and consciousness and whatever. And, and so the universe can exist everywhere. 
still the, the chance to get um, DNA or RNA out of random molecule collisions is just 1 to 10 to the power of 260. So even if I'm wrong with all the quantum mechanics, still you, you probably still are left with just Earth. Okay, galaxy distribution anomalies. You have this, um, you notice some pattern here. There's this concentric structure here. And for from 2016 till, uh, till basically this year, I was trying to explain this in a similar way I explained the uh, CMB anomalies. I thought that it has to do with uh, maybe the Earth goes into uh, spiral arms and is hidden and then it observes less and this uh, so when it's outside the spiral arm it observes more and then less again and this influences how the universe is built up in a future to past fashion but um, um, you, you, could, you could try to map the north-south asymmetry here to, to this here but the concentric shells here actually they are not um, I figured out this year that they are not really explained by, um, by, by, by this observer, uh, or by this abundance of future observation. I call it a future uh, abundance of future observation principle. You you have more observation and less observation, and it, it influences how the universe is, is built up, how it drops out of, from a vast superposition to a certain state. So the reason why the model is not working is that if you base the, 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 the uh, spiral rotation speed, the pattern rotation speed, um, and the normal distance of normal cosmology, you could, you could have it match here with this distance is 250 million light years. But if you use space particleism theory and, and, and its equations, you find that it seems to be 250 million light years in standard cosmology, but in Space particleism theory is actually one billion light like, years, so it, it, the, the correlation is destroyed by that. And um, the standard view actually originally, what's this? So uh, uh, this originally, met, very few people knew about this uh, pattern here, this concentric shells was very new, but nowadays it's already. Um, well accepted by the mainstream and it's usually explained with what, uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations like oscillations in the uh, like sound waves in the early universe before decoupling and uh, I used my theory to calculate those sound waves and the right size for this um, concentric shells um, uh, appeared um, so yeah, this is this is about the old interpretation. Maybe we don't need to go into detail with that. Here I already mentioned this north-south asymmetry. I've talked to one of the discoverers of this pattern, um, and he thinks, or oh, maybe the fact that there is more stuff here than here is maybe it's just because we survey the northern hemisphere more carefully than the southern hemisphere. But I mean, this uh, slow digital sky survey is based upon was taken by a satellite. I don't think that the satellite, because it's on an American satellite, will, uh, will only look to the north. I don't like the south. I don't think that's the right explanation. So I think there's some slight uh, asymmetry. So the Fermi paradox, where is everybody? Um, yeah, I mean, aware that this interpretation may lead to solipsism. Yeah, I mentioned this before. Uh, after thinking about how other observers lie on the past lifetime of a given observer. Um, quantum mentality can prevent this form of solipsism, but cannot prevent solipsism on a cosmological scale. So I call it this cosmological solipsism. Um, other implications, consciousness beings can only exist on the conscious mass lines. DNA can only form out in a maximally superposition paths with the consciousness inhabited future determining the unconscious path. So basically everything that's happened before the emergence of life is, is just an artifact, it's not really real, it's just a, a, a fake path, so, so to say. Um, yeah. uh, 
chronology protection conjecture. The theory doesn't allow wormholes, obviously, because uh, wormholes need to have the span of space, and I don't have span of space. So there's no back and future movies anymore. And the information paradox. If mass is a side effect of charge, then like holes can lose mass through photons. So, um, um, yeah, because if, if, if gravity comes from this uh, virtual photons, from the charges, if, if gravity only comes from charge, photons don't have charge, so obviously a, a black hole would not shrink from, from this type of radiation. So there's no information paradox. And also for other reasons, because uh, there's this uh, Indian physicist, uh, Abbas Mitra, and he also believes that black holes, they, they don't have singularities when they, and I also think this, because when a black hole collapses, uh, time dilation becomes so, becomes infinite before it becomes a black hole. So if you, like him, believe in, in the passage of time being real, you can't do crazy stuff like saying, oh yes, but but when you go into the black hole, space and time are, are switching sides and are flipped around, and they're flipped around again, and then you have this thing. All this, all this stuff doesn't work if you believe that time is real and, and time is changed. But many people believe in this geometric time. If you believe in geometric time, you can have time for me going up like this and for another person going like this. So you would have orthogonal time. And I don't believe in that. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if anybody wants a break or something. Okay, um, so we can go break at any one. Do you want me to go start it or you want to start it? Maybe. Tomorrow I think there is a shoot Maybe a Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, that was the, you, you covered a lot of uh, material.